are really excited about having, uh, having today, which is a discussion about people, power, and health equity from somebody we've come to respect, Fernando and I, as um, co-directors of the Center for Community Health Equity, and that's uh, Jim Lloyd. Um, and Jim is with uh, the department, uh, Cook County Department of Public Health, and has been a senior epidemiologist and uh, been involved in some of the issues around building the WE plan and other activities for uh, Cook County, and uh, has been really active with some of the work with even uh, health and medicine with a health equity group that was funded by uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to work on these issues in the region. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate his uh, passion for this uh, activity around health equity and his uh, <coughs> unique perspective about what it means uh, from a public health point of view and what we can do uh, as a group together. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Jim. And he asked me to give him a reminder about halfway through, uh, where after his presentation, he wants to try to open it up so that we have more of a dialogue and a discussion. Uh, we are taping some of the first part of his slides so we can have this available for people who couldn't make it. Uh, and then we'll shut it off before the discussion starts happening. All right, thank you, Jim. Thank Appreciate you, Rush. Thank you. to be here and thank you, uh, Raj and Fernando and uh, the Center uh, for Community Health Equity for inviting me here today. Um, I'm really happy to, to do this and um, if nothing else, uh, you've got a free lunch. Hope I provide something uh, useful. Um, so uh, I do want to have some dialogue and, um, um, and we'll just get started. Um, so I understand there's a class coming in at, at uh, about 10 to the hour, so we'll go for about 25 or 30 minutes. Um, so I've been influenced yesterday a lot by, um, in the last few days, about the uh, Martin Luther King um, uh, holiday and marking the uh, marking his work, um, which was so crucial for our country and the world. And so um, I saw some quotes from uh, online, um, and I like this one, and I put it up on the on the slide that when the people are mired in oppression, they realize deliverance only when they have accumulated the power to enforce change. And I think that's something that is at the heart of um, health inequities and really in public health and health in general, is that we have to understand oppression and, and think about that, and we also need to look at uh, power for the change we need. So I'm gonna talk really quickly today about the inequitable, um, some evidence about the inequitable distribution, just briefly. Uh, I know most of us are pretty aware of this inequitable distribution of health and well-being. Um, also some theory. Uh, there's nothing as practical as a good theory. Um, because it tells us what to do, basically. Right? It kind of organizes our thoughts and helps us uh, reiterate a better thing. Um, I'm going to talk especially about the work that I've been invested a lot in for about 10 years, the Collaborative for Health Equity Cook County, particularly minimum wage work and the Protect Immigrant Health Now campaign. And then I'm gonna challenge all of us to look at minimum wage and the role of US healthcare in uh, generating poverty. And then the dialogue, as I said. So this was from a, this slide shows um, uh, quint, uh, five, uh, not quant, quintiles, of um, income in um, suburban county and the city and shows that there's um, life expectancy is, is associated with um, these different uh, family incomes of these uh, neighborhoods and census tracts. Um, and this was from our uh, Collaborative for Health Equity report back in 2012. Um, so we made six recommendations in that report. We said that uh, funds should be allocated to increase healthy food retail in neighborhoods with low food access, that the voices and aspirations of neighborhood residents be reflected in solutions to hunger and poor nutrition, and that we wanted to ensure workplace justice for workers throughout the food chain, and specifically in the restaurant in industry. And uh, we said that persistent poverty should be addressed by engaging multiple sectors, uh, and that the WHO 2008 final report on the commissions of, uh, Commission on the Social Determinants of Health be implemented. So uh, some uh, ambitious um, but good um, recommendations in that report. Another evidence is from the recent um, uh, article, uh, which uh, Fernando and uh, folks from Chicago, Emily LaPlan and David Ansel and uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Lang Mai uh, are authored. And I think the thing that I want to uh, point out here is that 
um, there, there is a, uh, they found a gap of 15 years in life expectancy between community areas in Chicago, and the, the uh, ICE index of concentration at the extremes measure was uh, very effective, it was more effective and showed a steeper gradient um, in, in associating uh, with, with uh, premature mortality under age, before age 65 years. Um, and I think one of the things that I found from Nancy Krieger was that this helps us frame the, um, uh, the problem of health inequities as these relationships between groups of the privileged and um, uh, folks who are uh, not privileged, uh, groups of, uh, who are deprived, uh, as opposed to only focusing on uh, so-called disadvantaged people. And so that's an, another evidence and kind of shifts to what I'm looking at. Hey, you know, I just want to say I appreciate the attempt at carrying a home field advantage here. This kid. <laughs> <laughs> um, more evidence here about uh, from the uh, Ch uh, Child Opportunity Index um, shows that um, there is a proportion of uh, black children and Latino children. This is a kindergarten through uh, end of high school. Um, High, highly uh, distributed in the very low and low um, opportunity areas. Um, and you can see that on the left of this chart. Um, and there are very few black and Latino children in Cook County. This is the Cook County breakdown of the larger data set of MSA from Child Opportunity Index. Um, so you see that this is uh, inequitable uh, racial, uh, racialized uh, opportunities for children. Um, and here it's the exact opposite, where we see a clear trend where um, I, I'm looking at about 2% of white children, uh, maybe about 12% of white children are in the low and very low opportunity areas. Um, and uh, I was reminded, and looking back at this, that there is an article by a Dr. Gee saying that when we present data and we don't include uh, other races or American Indian Alaskan Native, um, Asian uh, Native American, uh, Asian or Native uh, Hawaiian, other Pacific Islanders, um, that this is uh, really erasing whole groups of people from the consciousness and from our, our understanding. And so I did include them, and I think it's something for us to think about, even though sometimes we say, oh, it's not, it's not statistically significant or low numbers. Um, so uh, let's move. Some examples of uh, structure. When I talk about structure, this is one that our American government, uh, the Federal Reserve, violated African Americans' legal and constitutional rights because their own data showed that there was uh, discrimination in uh, access to lending. Uh, and so this is an example of sort of the, one of the drivers of that segregation that results in health inequities and those uh, big discrepancies by child opportunity. Another one is right here at home from our Cook County government, our assessor specifically. Um, recently, um, $2.2 billion in property taxes were shifted onto the bottom 80% of houses from the top 20% of houses by, by their value. And so specifically, these houses, uh, of the, the most expensive houses in the top 20% uh, were uh, undervalued. And that undervaluing uh, then uh, resulted in them paying less taxes, and all those taxes were shifted onto the uh, bottom 20, 80%. And, uh, and this was another example of, uh, of structural racism because it, this was disproportionately affecting homeowners who were homeowners of color. And this uh, chart is from a suit by many uh, housing organizations around the country uh, against uh, Cook County and the assessor. So this is another example of that uh, really shifts that ice indicator. So uh, some theory, uh, this is a really nice graphic. Um, I've never seen it before. It's from the Hawaii Department of Public Health. Thought it was really cool. The downstream describes, the downstream is, is Makai, uh, downstream. Uh, upstream you see uh, over the waterfall is the upstream root causes. That's where we wanna go. That's, and they describe it as political context and governance. And um, I just recently saw a uh, sort of a similar with colors uh, graphic by uh, Castrucci and one other author in a health affairs blog. And I think this is so much better. And, and I would tell respectfully to uh, Mr. Castrucci that we need, we need to talk about politics and governance. Um, and so this is something that's kind of accessible and, and helps us. 
Um, a more uh, theoretical, technical uh, uh, framework that I think has lots of detail in it, which specifically mentions power, is from the 2010 Solar and Irwin expl ex explanation of the uh, WHO approach. Um, and here we see things way up on, the, on that left side. Uh, we see the labor market. So that's where our minimum wage uh, policies would be. That's where our fight for 15. That's where our tipped minimum wage, our socioeconomic economic, political context, that's where our $7.50 federal minimum wage would come in. Um, and also, uh, we looked at uh, immigration in Chaco County. So you would see uh, uh, social protection or other macroeconomic policies, uh, immigration policies. Um, and those are the structural determinants um, they interact with that other box there, social economic position, and stratification uh, takes, takes place there. Uh, on the left side, downstream is the health system. Um, so we tend to focus and put uh, the vast majority of our funds in the health system, um, and uh, that's, that's really downstream according to this. Uh, so an important piece of this is that conflating the social determinants of health and the social processes that shape those determinants, unequal distribution, can seriously mislead policy. Policy objectives will be defined quite differently depending on whether the aim is to address determinants of health or determinants of health inequities. So this is a quote from Solar and Irwin, and it gets at that idea that we can say, well, let's look at folks who are hungry and screen folks who are hungry, and then refer them to a uh, a mobile uh, charity food bins, so they're not hungry, it's pretty far downstream. It's great to look at hungry people, but why are they hungry? And that's going upstream, these. And, and why are particularly groups of uh, privileged folks hungry and others are not, right? So this this is another, uh, so uh, how am I doing up to? 15 minutes, okay. The health department has made some uh, strides in addressing this. Um, we used uh, Race, the Power of an Illusion. We talked about the history of immigration. And we talked, we did some training on uh, the, not the ICE measure, but the immigration and customs enforcement, uh, the uh, immigration folks, ICE, how they could be threatening our clients. And uh, staff wanted, want, wanted training. Uh, they wanted to have a list of referral to organizations, and we wanted welcoming signage. And um, to this day, we really haven't gotten it. Uh, that's a longer story. Uh, it resulted in one of our campaigns of Jacob County. Uh, seven elements of health equity practice. I'll just point your attention uh, to a, uh, the fourth bullet down. Uh, Jacob County is actually a campaign initiated and led by others. The health department supports Jacob County's work, but does not control Jacob County. So it gives of my time, but it's controlled by a steering committee, and hence our policies and actions are not dictated by the county government or the Cook County Health Department which could set up some tension, one might imagine, between my bosses. Uh, but nonetheless, this is a element of health equity practice uh, supported by NATO, and I made this what I hope is a nice little summary of it from uh, the book by NATO. The Chaco County is part of the National Collaborative for Health Equity. There's 19 teams, so we're the one in the middle uh, with, uh, in Cook County, Illinois. Um, so one of the things that we did in our campaigns was working on the minimum wage. One of our most recent uh, uh, successes was on our Chaco County letterhead, getting about 100 signatures. Um, it was published in the Sun-Times, I think online. Um, and uh, Dr. Ansel uh, and Linda Ray Murray uh, were uh, kind enough to champion that and sign that op-ed letter. Um, but um, it was really not raising the minimum wage to $15, and it also, did not end the uh, sub-minimum wage uh, for tipped workers, um, but there were two community organizations that were trying to get suburbs to opt in to the county ordinance, and so we wanted to support those two community organizations, Chaco County did. But our position is really uh, reflected in this slide, that we need one fair wage, that women and people of color and immigrants should not be thrown under the bus uh, to a sub-minimum wage. This is a very complicated slide, um, but basically, um, it shows that uh, the National Restaurant Association in 1996, whose president was Herman Cain, whose photo is here, um, together with workers' advocates and the U.S. Congress, basically decided, they made a deal, that they said, we will not raise, we will allow you to raise the regular minimum wage only if we don't have to raise the tipped minimum wage. That's basically what that says. 
Um, and um, so anybody who's a tipped wage worker um, is allowed to get paid uh, as low as $2.13 an hour in uh, both in the majority of the states. Um, and uh, this, this red line and the black line shows the discrepancy. The red line is the subminimum wage and the discrepancy between the federal minimum wage. It's now, uh, you're basically, people who tip were supposed to make up the gap. And so the gap right now is 71%. So we worked with organizers in Calumet City. Uh, we did, they did some protests in City Hall, Calumet City. Uh, we succeeded. Um, together with Seth Crowley, Proclamatorius Unidos, Immigrant Workers Project, and Rock Chicago, Shriver Center, and other organizations, um, they, uh, they were the first municipality to, in, to pass uh, by 80% a uh, referendum so, uh, for one fair wage, meaning everybody in, in Calumet City would earn one minimum wage, and they supported the $15 minimum wage. Um, so the next is Public Health Woke Campaign of Chaffin County. It was really a coalition, and we were really uh, trying to address, first, the county public health and healthcare systems actions to protect immigrant health. Um, we did a number of things. There were many, many partners, uh, including Rush and many other folks, uh, in supporting a um, a gathering of folks in uh, in a uh, kind of a workshop, an all-day workshop, which was highly it was like 140 people all day. Most people stayed all day, um, but there was a lot of founding partners. You can see here. Um, we did a thunderclap, which is a social media campaign, and we targeted um, Dr. Jay Shannon, my my colleague, and also County Board President Tony Preckwinkle. We asked people to call them and urge them to take action. And uh, we had six demands. Uh, met, uh, Linda Ray Murray gave a very uh, <coughs> critical and profound uh, Medicine Grand Rounds presentation, uh, critiquing the lack of action and urgency on protecting um, uh, immigrant health and from ICE. Uh, and um, we did have some uh, weaknesses and blind spots. We thought that we didn't uh, do enough outreach and, and we thought we weren't inclusive enough. Of, of groups who are oppressed. And uh, we did get this presentation. I'm gonna skip this one. Uh, so Linda Murray gave a report card on our demands and basically the highest grade was D minus. So that was in our grand rounds. We gave a presentation on this to the last ABJ uh, meeting in San Diego. Um, this is a crucial tool and I would urge everybody who hasn't seen this or looked at it online to just search this Human Impact Partners and Public Health Awaken um, put together an immigrant rights guide. And this really spurred um, Che Cook County's work both in the health department and also outside of the health department. and really led to all of this uh, increased awareness and a lot of activity. I was really disappointed at, at you know, uh, my, my colleagues and friends' lack of understanding. I can't understand, that. how can they not understand how urgent this is? We're, we're public health people, we're health people, and even getting the welcoming sign uh, was a big struggle. Um, so more needs to be done. So um, we did have a lot of impact with the, uh, we shut down the phone system of, uh, of uh, President Preckwinkle, got her attention. Uh, the story went that uh, people from the president's office were calling Cook County Commissioner uh, Jesus Garcia and saying, stop these people, stop these people. What are, you, what are they doing? And he said, I can't, I don't control them. You know, uh, they're, they're not my people. They do what they're doing. Uh, so uh, they, they didn't know what Thunderclap was. I, I didn't know what Thunderclap was either. Uh, but it was basically required a lot of work to get people to sign up. Um, so part of that was we had community health workers who are pictured here give testimony to the uh, health and hospital system uh, independent board, which actually governs this and makes decisions. Five minutes, thanks. Um, so Ilda Hernandez and Saida Martinez um, were videotaped because they felt that they couldn't come to our Spirit of 1848 session in San Diego in November. Um, there's the video link, um, and it's on our, it's not on our Chase Petty website, but uh, I'll put these slides up and you can check out their video. It's about 15 minutes. It's very powerful. We subtitled it. Um, we did a survey. I'm going to skip through this pretty quickly. <coughs> One survey we found in our, in our public health book was that 61% of the respondents said my clients are less likely to sign up for public health program services and healthcare. 
Another one, 95% said that clients or their family members have shown increased fear, stress, or other mental, emotional health impacts. I'm gonna keep moving. These, this was our some of our, our supporting folks for our uh, workshop on February 3rd. The upper left is uh, Susan Avila holding up signs uh, with a number of folks in that meeting where people gave testimony. This is a screenshot of a cell phone with the public health with the uh, tool, our social media thunderclap tool. I can talk about that a little bit more. Um, this is actually on our Chaco County website. You can see everybody who gave testimony uh, by video at the independent board meeting. So there's building power. Historically, Cook County physicians have cared about social justice and they marched for better patient care. Um, so now, in terms of the challenge to us working in healthcare, um, hospitals, about 25% of, um, I'm just gonna read this to get it right. Hospitals employ 25.3% of healthcare workers earning less than $15 an hour, or 1.5 million people. <laughs> At a Illinois Hospital Association protest at the end of last year, um, this woman, a uh, health services worker, Tachina Haywood, a certified nursing assistant, um, described her budget. She earns $1,600 a month, and this is all her bills, and she ends up having like less than $70 at the end. Um, and uh, there were four hospital CEOs. One was Dean Harrison. You'll see his picture there on the left. Um, from Northwestern Medicine CEO. His pay is 4.2 million. So he earns $2,000 now. Um, one CEO I saw earned uh, $13 million salary. So I think we can fairly say that hospital compensation structure is a root cause of health inequities. Uh, it's structurally racist, it's structurally sexist. So the structure means that it's not like these CEOs are like like evil people, right? Personal. But they benefit from the system. So that's one of the things I want to answer. Who benefits and why is this happening? It happens because of structure and structural violence, if you will. But people benefit in order to make a profit, or in order to make a, if it's a non-profit hospital, you call it the surplus. It's the surplus. Why should a non, why should a tax exempt institution does not pay taxes? Why should a tax exempt institution be allowed to generate this type of inequity? And so, and also to be, I think, anti-union historically. Uh, and you can tell me more about that. So 1.7 million female healthcare workers and their children lived in poverty. Raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour would reduce poverty rates among female healthcare workers by 27 to 50%. Uh, so the healthcare service workers in Chicago challenged these, there's four uh, CEOs they specifically called out to live on $13 an hour. One of those folks was uh, my commissioner, Brandon, Johnson, commissioner of the first district, and he said he called on them to try to live on $13 an hour during the holiday season. That if they walked in those health workers' shoes, there would be no question that he thought they would have a new perspective uh, about valuing labor and dedication and the service to patients and families. Um, so I'm gonna end this by saying that, um, why, why is this happening? Partly structural violence, it's not so plainly visible. It's the uh, air we breathe, or it's the, it's the water that's just totally calm. Um, although I think many of us see it, um, especially recently. Uh, this was a tough three or four days where we had a judge basically support the code of silence in Cook County by acquitting three police who, to me, to my way of seeing the video, the Laquan McDonald shooting video, lied. So. That's pretty visible. And I would say policing is structural violence. It's a structural cause of health inequities. But in other ways, it's not. Like that tipped minimum wage, you know, that originates in slavery. Uh, it, the Pullman workers, uh, the first Pullman workers who worked as uh, working on the Pullman cars, 
porch. They, they said, uh, well, they're, they're former slaves. They're slaves. They really do sell. We let them live off tips, according to uh, Forked, the book called Forked, F-O-R-K-E-D, by uh, the Rock, Rock United founder, whose name is me. Dr. Ansel describes in his book, The Death Gap, that exploitative market capitalism perpetuates racism, poverty, and, and income inequality. And uh, Scott Samuel Smith described that really we're, we're, um, we're, we're in this uh, blame the victim uh, kind of mentality rather than tackling corporate and economic causes of the problem. Because of our kind of liberal system, our macroeconomic policies, uh, where all economic activities are just valued. Because they're economic activities and we value economic growth maybe over everything else. So I'm going to end by this saying, who benefits? Um, this is from a slide presentation that we used in our health uh, department for uh, dialogues on roots of health inequities. Um, folks who are privileged are not our non-target groups in this uh, language. Non-target groups are groups most likely to be uh, receive honored privileges and benefits because of group membership. <coughs> and this is from uh, NHO, a NHO slide presentation at the roots of health inequity.org. One. So here's some examples of non-target groups. Uh, white people, people who own property, men, heterosexual people, people without disability, etc. Uh, target groups, people of color, poor people, working class, women. So if we look at the folks who are disproportionately hit by low wages in the healthcare system, it's folks, it's it's an intersectional intersectionality application here. Women of color. Right? And their children. Right? So for every oppressed group, there's a privileged group. Um, this is kind of a real quick way of trying to describe it. We've had some really good dialogues in my health department about this. Um, and I hope we can have a dialogue too now. So um, I'm going to end on that.